Hello, my name is Malik Jabbar, the author of the Astrological Foundation of the Christ Myth in four volumes, and other books on the subject of astrotheology. Our subject today is the biblical symbolism of Ezekiel's will. We want to give an astrotheological interpretation of that symbolism. According to the Bible, the man Ezekiel was a Hebrew priest that was made captive along with many other Hebrews by the Babylonians when they overran Jerusalem in the 6th century BC. As the Bible story goes, the Judean captives were marched from Jerusalem to Babylon where they became subjects to the Babylonian Empire. There in Babylonia, the Hebrews remained the servants and subjects of the Babylonians until some time later in the 6th century BC, at which time the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians. The Persians defeated the Babylonians and took control of Babylon's colonial possessions, which included the Jewish homeland of Judea. They allowed the Jews to return to Judea. Now, according to the Bible, while the priest Ezekiel was in captivity in Babylon, he had a number of spiritual visions or revelations. One of these visions he described as that of a great set of wheels in the sky. Wheels whose configuration he described as appearing as a wheel within another wheel. These wheels appeared as a gigantic whirling fortress high up in the heavens. This apparatus was manned or operated by four humongous multi-headed creatures. These creatures were positioned at the four opposing corners of the craft. Ezekiel described the faces of these creatures as that of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. This tale is clearly mythological. Our goal as we proceed is to give the astrotheological interpretation of this story. So we want to proceed with an astrotheological interpretation of the biblical vision of Ezekiel of that fantastic fortress in the sky that the Bible describes as a wheel in the middle of another wheel. Astrotheology is fundamentally based on the science of astronomy. Although in fact, astrotheology covers a lot more than astronomy. It covers all of the earth sciences without exception. But the vital point that we also need to remember, and this is very important, is that the science of astronomy pursuant to correct timekeeping daily, annually, and throughout the ages of time was the prime focus of most ancient mythology. I repeat, the tracking of time throughout seasons, the years, and the ages of times and over thousands of years was the prime focus of the symbolism underlying ancient cosmic mythology. It was astrotheology that was the underlying basis for ancient cosmic mythology. And further, ancient cosmic mythology was the model after which our modern religions have been fashioned. Our modern religions, to an overwhelming degree, are founded on ancient star lore. That is to say, symbolism that reflects the interplay of the cosmic lights. 
Our modern religions have evolved from ancient mythology. And ancient mythology itself evolved from astronomical symbolism. That is to say, the science of astrotheology. So that is the chain of our religious evolution. First, there was astronomy that was written in a symbolic format. Then came cosmic mythology. And from cosmic mythology, there emerged all of our ancient religions, including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and the others. It was the mysteries of the changing dynamics of the sky that intrigued and fascinated ancient humanity over and beyond everything else that they witnessed in their earthly environment. Ancient society saw the unbreakable bond between the sky and the earth. They saw the dynamic interplay between these two forces, which was normally quiescent, but at other times volatile and menacing. The interplay between sky and earth governed and dominated every element of the earthly habitat back then, as it yet does today. The symbolism, excuse me, the symbolism of Ezekiel's will is pure astrotheological symbolism. This will be confirmed as we proceed. I will use the graphic that is before us to help in that explanation. But before we go in details of our explanation, I want to briefly reference the four accepted methods of interpretation that most Bible scholars use when studying and interpreting the biblical scriptures. Those four methods being the literal, the allegorical, the tropological, and the anagogical. A brief introduction to these other methods of interpretation will help us appreciate the high superiority of the astrotheological system, which I advocate in my books. So the Bible scholars, for the most part, follow four interpreted avenues when evaluating biblical literature. That is to say, they classify the Bible into four separate classifications of interpretation. These classifications, or we could say methodologies, are termed the literal, allegorical, tropological, and anagogical. Now for those that follow the literal interpretation, they accept the Bible at face value. No matter how absurd the biblical pronouncement may be, such as God creating the world in six days, even before the day as we know it had come into existence, or Adam and Eve having a conversation with a snake. To those that take the Bible literally, it doesn't matter how ridiculous a biblical statement is, their faith in the infallible word of the Bible re requires them to believe it, just as it is written. That is the way of the literal interpretation. The allegorical interpretation is an interpretation that is non-literal. It is metaphorical, somewhat like a parable. Allegorical indicates that the words or statements utilized have a hidden meaning, and the truth is not found in the literal meaning but rather in the hidden meaning, that is to say, an understanding or interpretation derived from the symbolic structure of the words. In the Bible, Jesus, Jesus excuse me, was asked why he at times, why at times he smoked in parables. And he answered, it was so as to conceal the truth from the unworthy. I repeat, 
Jesus was asked why at times he spoke in parables. And he answered, it was so as to conceal the truth from the unworthy. Now, this statement can be found in the uh, 13th chapter of Matthew. So allegories and parables are very similar, but they are not exactly the same. The parables are normally announced and presented as parables within the structure of the Bible sentence. The writer introduces the parable by saying, let me tell you the parable of this or that and so forth, and then proceeds to tell a riddle or parable of some event which has a hidden meaning. There are many parables in the Bible, but there's a lot more allegory. And the difference between the two is very important. Allegories, allegories have no introduction. Allegories appear straightforward and literal, and it's up to the intellect of the reader to detect by reason of the implausibility of the content that the verses must be an allegory. For example, it is given in the third chapter of 1 Kings that Solomon was confronted by two women, both claiming to be the mother of a certain child. Solomon didn't know which one of the women was telling the truth. There were no witnesses. Therefore, Solomon could not determine who was the rightful mother of the child. So he ordered that the child be cut in half and one half of the dead carcass be given to each of the women who claim to be the parent of the child. This tale is often cited to exemplify the wisdom of Solomon. This story appears in the Bible as an actual historical event. I repeat, this story appears in the Bible as an actual historical event in the third chapter of 1 Kings. It is not introduced as a parable or riddle. It is left to the intelligence of the reader to discern that the story must be allegorical. This marks the difference between parables and allegory. The same goes for the Eden story about a talking serpent. It is assumed that the average rational human being can discern that such a tale must be allegorical, without doubt, on the basis of minimal common sense. Who in their right mind would believe that a snake can have a conversation with a human being? That is the question that it con confronts us. So that is the way of allegory. And the Bible is replete with allegorical stories. As for the tropological interpretation, it refers to matters of morality and human conduct. Reverends will often use tropological interpretations in their sermons to convey a theme of, of morality or ethics uh, and so forth to their audience. And the anagogical interpretation, it refers to that which is extraterrestrial or heavenly or mystical, that which pertains to the human soul, the afterlife. So those are the four basic and common means of biblical interpretation used by biblical scholars, the literal, the allegorical, the tropological, and the anagogical. However, it is the interpretation of astrotheology that preceded all the others. It is the interpretation of astrotheology that preceded all the others. This fact will become increasingly clear as we become more and more intimately acquainted with the methodology of astrotheology. Astrotheology is actually the original symbolism first intended when the scriptures were originally written. 
astrotheology is the basis and the source. And I need to repeat, astrotheology is actually the original symbolism first intended when the scriptures were originally written. In brutal fact, if the truth be told, astrotheology is vitally linked to our very survival as a species upon this planet. Because it is through astrotheology that we not only track and chart the seasons of the year, but also the seasons of the ages, some of which are very challenging to our survival as a human race of people. Astrotheology is key. Astrotheology is the underpinning, the underpinning of all the world's ancient religions. Back at a time in prehistory when there was only one world religion, howbeit with varied uh, cultural faces. The world and universe is a clock and the science that tracks and records the clock and the events on earth that are associated with the positions of that clock is astrotheology. The position of the celestial, celestial clock refers to the configurations of the constellations, planets, suns, and stars as recorded by the ancients in their art, their mythological tales, their monuments, and similar things. And I need to repeat, the whirling universe, as you're looking at with this uh, graphic before you, the whirling universe is a clock, and the science that tracks and records that clock and the events on Earth that are associated with the positions of the that clock is astrotheology. The position of the celestial clock refers to the configurations of the constellations, the planets, sun, and stars as recorded by the ancients in their art and their mythological tales, and so forth. Astrotheology measures not only the seasons of the years, but measures the ages and eons of time. Our planet is not limited to annual cycles that mark the four seasons of the year. Our planet has climatic seasons that stretch into thousands of years, as geologically defined, into eons, eras, periods, and epochs, as well as ages of time. Our planet goes through ages and epochs of prolonged darkness, of prolonged light, of intense heat, of intense cold, of tormenting winds, of upheavals affecting seas and the land. These re events have been witnessed by the ancients and they have been recorded in their mythological tales. With reference to the eternal cosmic clock of time, that world around us, the cosmic clock, clock, the cosmic sky. And the ancient, ancients have recorded these events. Over time, our planet is beset by cyclic events whose return is forecast by the cosmic clock that slowly revolves around our planet. And this, the, and this is the essence of the science of astrotheology. And this is what we want to pursue in our ex explanations as we proceed. Again, our subject at this time is the symbolism of Ezekiel's will. I will use the graphic before us to help in the explanation of that symbolism. Now, briefly again to review, uh, the story of Ezekiel is found in the uh, first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, the story of uh, Ezekiel's vision of the will. 
it states that Ezekiel was a priest prophet among the Judeans during the time of the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. It is stated that Ezekiel saw a vision of a great flying fortress in the sky that was shaped as a wheel in the middle of a wheel and was manned by four terrible creatures or beasts situated at the four opposing corners of the sky fortress. And the beasts each had four faces, including the faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. So that's the gist, gist of it, and that uh, is the symbolism of this, is what we want to explain in, in this presentation. Now before we, uh, before we delve into the symbolism of Ezekiel's will, I first need to explain the fundamentals of the graphic that is before us. We are looking at a computer animation of the revolving universe as seen from the earth. Each day of 24 hours, the sun appears to, to uh, revolve around the earth because of the rotation of the earth on its axis. And yearly, the universe itself appears to revolve around the earth. This is because as the earth revolves around the sun, the backdrop of stars behind the sun that we see at night progresses westward about one degree, creating the illusion that the universe is actually uh, revolving around us, which is just the apparent appearance, not the actual appearance. Now I am going to uh, point out some things on this uh, graphic to help this uh, become somewhat more clear. We're only going to point to those elements of this uh, graphic that has a direct relationship uh, with uh, the symbolism of Ezekiel's will. So we need not be concerned really uh, with about 99% of this, this, this uh, information on this graph. It, it, it's really not pertinent to uh, what we're going to go over. But we need uh, this whole picture so that we can uh, put in perspective the uh, symbolism of Ezekiel's will. So I will begin to point out a few things uh, on this for your edification so that we can go forward. Now our objective here is to show the connection between the uh, vision and of Ezekiel and uh, astrotheology. We know that astrotheology is uh, is uh, the symbol symbolism of religion uh, based on star lore. So basically, what I need to do is to show that. Ezekiel's uh, vision of these two wheels in the sky and of these four creatures that he was actually referring to uh, astronomical coordinates, to astronomical positions in the sky. And by doing that, I will prove the relationship between that vision that allegory, in a sense, showing that it was really based on astrotheological symbolism. But before we get into the aspects, I need to uh, orientate you to what we're looking at here. As I said, this is a computer animation of the universe. Uh, 
Now, actually, the universe is boundless. There are no limits to the universe. It goes on and on. It's infinite. And we notice here we have a uh, spherical representation of the universe. That is because when the astronomers make these animations, in order for our coordinate system to, to work, our coordinate system for the uh, heavens is based on uh, the Earth as a reference center. Uh, the equator, the, uh, the uh, North Pole and uh, lines of right ascension and uh, latitude and so forth. All of these uh, positions on Earth, in order for them to relate to the uh, cosmos, they must be expanded into the cosmos in a, in a similar fashion. So this causes their animations, uh, in many instances, to be spherical because the Earth is spherical. This way, the various positions expanded out into the sky would be correlated to the uh, Earth as the reference center. But in actuality, our uh, sky, it, it, uh, uh, our cosmos, it has no limit, it has no shape, it just goes on and on without end. And in fact, to give you a perspective on that, this is very, very compact and things are compressed together here in this animation. But now most of the stars that we are able to see with our naked eye they are in, in what we call the Milky Way galaxy, which is where our sun and our planet is. And our Milky Way galaxy, it is just, just one of billions of galaxies, according to the astronomer. It is one of billions with the B of galaxies. And within our galaxy, there are billions of stars and billions of planets, according to astronomers. In our one galaxy, there are billions of suns. There are billions of stars. You know, stars and suns, of course, are synonymous. And there are billions of planets. Uh, an untold number of, uh, of uh, solar systems. Uh, like ours with, uh, you know, suns with planets revolving around them. That's in our one galaxy. And there are billions of galaxies. <laughs> I mean, to think that there's a god king somewhere who created all of this, to me, it's just, it's just beyond rationality. But anyway, uh, and not only that, our sun... Some people often think the sun just is just uh, hanging in space. The sun is actually traveling through space uh, at somewhere around a half a million miles an hour. Uh, I think it's close to 515,000 miles an hour. The sun is traveling through space and pulling us along with it, according to the astronomers. And the sun and it's uh, revolving around its position uh, within the uh, Milky Way. I forget exactly where in the Milky Way it is. I think somewhere near the middle of it. But anyway, in the Milky Way, uh, it's, uh, the astronomers estimate it's up to 200,000 light years across. You know, light travels over 11 million miles in a minute. And the Milky Way is over, uh, uh, they estimate around 200,000 light years across, light years. So uh, we're talking about un un unimaginable uh, distances that uh, uh, we really cannot comprehend. But I just want to give you an idea that what we are looking at is really a terrific amount of space and uh, 
it's not representative of the uh, infinity of uh, of the universe or, 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 or even our galaxy. So I think that's one thing that needs to be uh, set up in our mind. Now, before we can get into the uh, symbolism of Ezekiel's will, I want to show us where we are as a uh, planet within this con conglomeration of uh, stars and uh, uh, constellations here that we're looking at. Of course, there's, there's just no way to actually see our Earth. But as I said, when uh, astronomers uh, produce these animations, they use our planet, and they must use our planet as a reference center. So we can go to certain uh, points on this graphic, and uh, by doing so, we can come up with a uh, determination of where our planet is located. Now, you will notice right here, you see the acronym NCP. NCP. That stands for the North Celestial Pole. That is saying that this is the crosshair right here. That is the North Celestial Pole. In other words, that is our pole, the pole of the Earth, extended into the infinite heavens. So, from a location on Earth, us looking up toward the, uh, the heavenly skies, we would be directly below the North Celestial Pole, saying that we were standing uh, on, on top of the Earth, so to speak. We would be at the, uh, uh, standing below the North Celestial Pole. And uh, now one thing for a minute, just give me for a minute. I'm gonna try and get this. I got this uh, caption here, which I wanted to get out of our way so I, I can better explain some things. So I'm gonna try and back up this rotation a little bit if you can bear with me. And uh, it might be a little flickering, I don't know. Okay. I want to have that out of the way. Uh, I don't know whether you read it or not. That was referring to the uh, the Bible verse uh, of Ezekiel symbolism, and uh, we'll come back to that a little later. At this point, I want to uh, explain uh, uh, our position and uh, certain aspects of this uh, this graphic. So as I said, when we look at the North Celestial Pole, that shows uh, uh, our position uh, within this whole arena. So, I mean, we would be less than, than microscopic, of course, but if we were uh, uh, at the top of, top of the world, so to speak, and... Uh, I'm going to stop this rotation so that I can better show some things. If we were to uh, be at the top of the world, so to speak, and what we're looking at here, excuse me, what we're looking at here uh, as, this, as this world turns, a complete revolution is representing uh, the one-year cycle whereas the uh, the universe seems to revolve around the planet Earth in one year. And, uh, of course, daily, the sun appears to uh, revolve around the, uh, the Earth. But the same, uh, the same illusion takes place yearly also. The sun appears to revolve around the earth. I want to give you a, 
general idea by starting it, 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 it up again. Now what we see right here, this of course is the sun. You see the uh, the word here for the sun. And uh, the sun is situated here. This uh, kind of uh, golden line here, it represents the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the uh, path of the sun around the earth as it travels around the earth during the course of a year. That's what this line represents. And this other line here, this greenish, uh, I should say line, I should say uh, ellipse or circle, it represents the celestial equator. That represents the celestial equator. As I said, the Earth is a reference point that the astronomers use uh, in, uh, in measuring and, uh, and uh, calculating these positions of, of things in Earth. So the celestial equator is simply an, an extension of the Earth equator into the infinite universe, the celestial equator. And the ecliptic is representing the uh, pathway of the sun around the earth, the apparent pathway. And as I as I said before, of course it's in my books and I think I'm I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it uh, online also, is that ancient symbolism is based on the apparent movements of the uh, heavenly lights. Not the actual movement, but the apparent movement. And the apparent movement is that everything is moving around the earth and the earth is the center of the universe. And that's how the uh, ancient symbolism is written. Now, what we have here, and let me uh, try to adjust this uh, graphic. There we go. This will kind of help us a little bit. It's a little bit dimmer, but I think this will help us somewhat. Uh, we notice uh, that the ecliptic and the celestial equator, they intersect at two different points. Here you see an intersection and up here you see an intersection. These are the equinoxes. Right here is the vernal equinox and up here represents the autumnal equinox. This is the intersection of the uh, uh, ecliptic and the uh, celestial equator in the heavens. And uh, the uh, winter solstice, now the winter solstice, it is uh, of course 90 degrees away from the uh, equinoxes. So and the winter solstice and the summer solstice, they represent the lowest and highest point of the sun in its rotation around the earth. And uh, the summer solstice is about right here on the ecliptic. I don't have a mark for it. And uh, the winter solstice is kind of behind our graph here, which I'm going to use in a minute to help explain this symbolism. It's right over here where, you know, it's exactly diagonal from the uh, summer solstice. Now, now, what I need to do, what my objective to do is to show that uh, Ezekiel's uh, vision 
refers to astrotheological symbolism. Now, I think you can see for yourself by now that the will in the middle of the will that uh, Ezekiel was referring to in his vision, that the book of Ezekiel was referring to, is very clear. It is referring to the intersections of the ecliptic of the sun and the celestial equator. It's plain as day that that appears up in the heavens as a wheel in the middle of the wheel. And he mentioned that there were four creatures that were manning this wheel. Now, and he said the creatures were a man, uh, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Uh, that is referring to the cardinal points. And we know all of our cardinal points are represented by uh, the zodiac. And we also know that our cardinal points uh, are shifting every 2,160 years. And that the cardinal point that we're in is determined by whichever zodiac sign is at the vernal equinox. Now all these matters are explained in details in my books. I'm just giving you information here that be, should be an adjunct or help to you when, when you read the books. But those four creatures are representing the four cardinal points. Now we know the era that he was referring to, this symbolism refers to, by the uh, by the cardinal points that were, were used. Uh, we are now approaching the, uh, the era of Aquarius. The uh, symbolism that he gives in the uh, book of Ezekiel, it is actually referring to the era of Taurus. We know that because he says that one of the creatures was an ox. Now, we know that the ox is of the bovine family. It's related to the bull. So that's efficient, uh, sufficient enough for us to know that that reference to one of the creatures being a beast, uh, being an ox, excuse me, uh, is actually referring to the era of Taurus because uh, an ox is just, you know, it's just like it's a member of the bovine, bovine family, so uh, that is Taurus. So that ox would be right in this position of the vernal equinox. And he mentioned that opposite the ox was the eagle. The eagle, uh, many years ago, as I said, this symbolism is reflective of the uh, era of Taurus, which was in 4,446 uh, BC, if my memory is correct. Uh, it's a long time ago. And uh, uh, there was a time when the eagle was the symbol for Scorpio. Now, Scorpio represents, is representative of, of uh, being opposite Taurus now. But uh, there was a time when eagle, when the eagle was used for that symbol. Now I explain uh, this and give reference for this in the book four of the Astrological Foundation of the Christ Myth. Uh, book four, second edition. Uh, uh, well, it's in the first edition too, but I recommend second edition because I got a lot more information in that book. It contains everything that was in the first uh, edition, but there's a lot more in it. So you can find detailed information on this in Book 4 of the Astrological Foundation of the Christ Myth. So the uh, ox is referring to Taurus, and the eagle is an old name for the position of Scorpio. And the other 
face of the beast uh, he described as a uh, as a man and the other as, and the other as a lion. Of course, when the uh, uh, when Taurus is at the vernal equinox, that puts Leo at the uh, summer solstice. Of course, Leo is the lion. And when uh, Taurus is at the uh, vernal equinox, that puts Aquarius at the, uh, at the winter solstice. And you know the icon of Aquarius, the sigil of Aquarius, Aquarius, is a man pouring out water. So there you have your man and uh, uh, at Aquarius, uh, you have your uh, lion at Leo, you have your eagle at uh, uh, Scorpio, uh, old name for Scorpio, and you have the ox at Taurus. That is the representation of the, uh, of the uh, symbolism of Ezekiel's will. Now, over here, I've made this little cutout to help you in understanding what I've just mentioned to you. Uh, getting, uh, getting away from all the uh, extra noise here. All we're showing here is the ecliptic and the celestial equator. And that's what you see here, but in this diagram, you're not bothered by, by all the other noise. But I wanted to uh, show you an actual moving graphic. So to put in better uh, perspective the, uh, 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 the whole symbolism so that you, you can see it actually rotating and, and movement, excuse me, and the, uh, and the stars and everything else. But right here... It's much easier to uh, to explain what you're looking at when you uh, look at this uh, this uh, cutout here, because here, uh, as I just said before, Leo is at the uh, the highest point of the ecliptic. This is during the era of Taurus, and this was uh, 4,446 BC. The uh, the times of the eras, you find them in Book One of the Astrological Foundation of Christ Smith. All of the eras, uh, when they come and go and so forth, uh, a list of all that is in Book One of the Astrological Foundation of Christ Smith. And down here, this is Aquarius man. This this intersection here, that's the man. That's Aquarius. So it's the same information you have over here. I've just put it in a little cutout so it's much clearer. And you don't have any complications. And then uh, over here, the uh, intersection uh, to the east is the vernal equinox, which is towards the ox. And then over here, you have uh, the uh, eagle, which uh, is an old name for the position of, of Scorpio. So I, do, I, I don't see how it could be any clearer. I mean, it's, it's just plain as day that uh, what uh, the book of Ezekiel was referring to uh, was none other than uh, astro-theological uh, uh, symbolism. And uh, I think that's about what I needed to uh, make plain in this uh, video. Now you can go to uh, my site, malikjabarbooks.com, and uh, you can read excerpts from my uh, book on various uh, subjects uh, uh, concerning astrotheology, of course, and uh, excerpts uh, from books from others, and. Uh, uh, you can also find a link there to uh, to uh, purchase uh, books uh, at uh, at terrific discounts. And I've written seven books on this subject, 
the astrological foundation of Christ missed in four volumes, and uh, the biggest laboratory lifted, lifting the Nazi veil. Uh, secret Origins of Judaism, and uh, and uh, you go to my site, there will be links where you can uh, find out how to purchase those books uh, from my site, or you can purchase them from other sources, but uh, you get some good discounts if you purchase them from my site. Now one thing I would uh, like you to do also, I intend to be to put up uh, some more uh, videos as uh, my time permits referring to astrotheology and that I believe will help in the study uh, of my books. So uh, uh, it would benefit uh, us all if you hit the sub subscribe button so that you can subscribe and whenever these videos come online you'll be notified and you'll uh, have a chance uh, to look at them uh, right away. So I think uh, we, we've covered it all. And uh, if I have forgotten anything, I'll just have to bring it back forward another time. But uh, then too, if I've forgotten everything, everything is in my books. I mean, these videos are just to, to help in the study of the books because in order to understand uh, astrotheology, uh, uh, to the best de degree, you need a, a basic knowledge of astronomy. You, you just have to have it. And uh, that's why I'm trying to present some of these videos that will kind of enhance the knowledge of astronomy, of, uh, of uh, observational astronomy. You know, we don't need an in-depth knowledge of uh, astronomy. I don't have an in-depth knowledge of astronomy. I'm not an astronomer. Uh, I've studied this uh, in pursuit of my uh, of my uh, understanding of astrotheology uh, for many years, several years ago. I've been at this for over 40 years. So, uh, I thank you for your time.